Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Bokatov, Bokatov. Good morning. Yes, we have. A, we got a lot of. We noticed there was a lot of young people really hungry last week, so we we threw together a bunch of sandwich stuff. We're going to have a sandwich lunch today. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come out today. It's a good day. God sanctified day. Adonai, in the name of Yeshua, we come before you. Thank you for your word, your truth. Thank you that you could bring the ancient ways back to our minds. Thank you for raising up and being restoring the house of Israel. Thank you for all your people that you've instilled your word in. Thank you for the prophets, the Torah, and Yahshua. Thank you for all your word. In Yahshua's name, amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, the blessed one. Blessed are you, Adonai, the blessed one forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who gave us a Torah of truth and the life of eternity he implanted within us. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen. This parshat this week is Korach. <clears throat> Separate himself, did Korach, son of Yitzchar, son of Kohat, son of Levi, with Datan, Abiram, sons of Elav, and on, sons of Pelet, the sons of Reuven. In Yahshua's name, Amen. Thank you, sir. Vayikha Korach ben Zichar, ben Kohat, ben Levi, v'datan v'ibiram, benai eleav, ben Pelet, benai Ruven. In Yahshua's name. It hit me this morning, this parshat, being read around the world, I call this Parshat the keeper of community because of the situation God designed. This is where a lot of organizations, even workplaces, should study Korach. One man got so many people killed so quick. One man, a narcissistic soul. 16, one through 50. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Paul. Now, Korach, the son of Isar, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, with the Than and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Pelet, sons of Ruben took men and they rose up before Moshe with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moshe and Aharon and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moshe heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korach and all his company saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korach, and all your company. Put fire in them, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the holy one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. And Moshe said to Korach, Hear now, you sons of Levi. 
Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is a harom that you complain against him? And Moshe sent to call Dathan and Avaram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land of flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance or fields and vineyards. Will you put and said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company will be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. Two hundred and fifty censers, both you and Aharon, each with his censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moshe and Aharon. And Karach gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord said to Moshe and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korach, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moshe rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korach, Dathan, and Abiram. <clears throat> Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Moshe said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korach, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all the Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. <coughs> And the Lord spoke to Moshe, selling, Tell Eliezer, the son of Aharon the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy, and they shall also be a sign to the children of Israel. So Eliezer the priest took the bronze censers, which were those who, who were burned up and presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider, who is not a descendant of Aharon, should come near to offer incense before the Lord, <clears throat> that he might not become like Korach and his com companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moshe. On the next day, all the children of Israel complained against Moshe and Aharon, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moshe and Aharon that they turned against the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moshe and Aharon came before the tabernacle of meeting. And the Lord said to Moshe, saying, Get away from among this con congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aharon took it as Moshe commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly, and already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, 
besides those who died in the Karach incident. So Aaron turned, returned to Moshe at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. This was, first we had Miriam. She got put outside the camp for rising up against Moshe. And then we had the ten spies. And then all that generation was told they're not going into the land. And now this. This is these past three parshas are a perfect example of how hard-headed human nature is. That's just unbelievable. They have the miracles of God in their face, and they still want to rise up against God's appointed leader. All these miracles. The sacrificial service to maintain the Mishkan was one of the main services to Adonai of the Levites. The other one is the role of the palm tree. The Psalms 92, 12 through 15. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who were planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Who is planted in the house of Adonai? The Levites. They were the only ones that allowed, the high priest was allowed into the Holy of Holies. And they were likened to the cedar of Lebanon and a palm tree. But why are the Levites compared to a palm tree? In Numbers 3, 6, he says, draw the Levites near. Draw them near. And he shall grow tall like a cedar in Lebanon. A person can be righteous in one of two ways. A cedar is tall, strong, beautiful, but it bears no fruit. The stature of this sort is viewed by the ancients as a person who studies Torah and observes mitzvot primarily for their own personal spiritual growth. Second, the Levites, on the other hand, are likened to a palm tree. Not as tall as a cedar and not as strong, but palm trees bear much fruit. This means a person who studies Torah to share and explain with others and help them to progress. One who is willing to sacrifice her own personal growth time to help others. This was one of the main roles of the Levites. So right off the bat, you can see what Korach was way off because of the one word, narcissism. He was a narcissistic soul. Although narcissism seems modern, it has been around for a very long time. In Greek mythology, Narcissus was known for his beauty and fixation on himself and his outer appearance. The story told about him is that after seeing his reflection in a pool of water, he falls in love with it as if it was another human being. The Hebrew names have meaning. The name of Korak is no, except, is no exception. It means ice, baldness, and frost in hell. How profound. He is no doubt the father of spiritual narcissism. You could say that Korak was a big fish in a big sea. He was a leader of the Kohathites, the most prestigious of the Levites. He was looked up to and respected. And that is the main element of why he was so successful in getting 250 men to come with him. Leaders of the community, a man of renown to join in the rebellion. <clears throat> and I personally think it was mainly because of Numbers 14, 34 through 35. According to the number of the days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. I thought it was amazing. And Moshe sent to call the son and Aviram and the sons of Elav. And they said, we will not come up. It is a small thing that you have brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us. Moreover, you haven't brought us into the land flowing with milk and honey. And they were the very ones that were scared of it. They twist it. You said they twist it around. They twist the whole concept and blame in Moshe for their mistake. So they were stuck in a bad situation. 
This week's Torah Pasha shows us the rebellion of Korach, a cousin of Moses. He argues that he is just as deserving of leadership as Moshe, claiming that Moshe took power for self-elevation. Then number 16.3, they gathered together against Moshe and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then did you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? In reality, he was accusing Moshe of what he himself was guilty of. It was very, very common today. It's very common. Even within the ministry, I have been accused of things that people were doing themselves. And it's amazing how they'll do that. Moshe in turn threatens Korach with powers of God in Numbers 16, 4 through 7. So when Moshe heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korach and all his company saying, tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is Kadosh and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this to censors, Korach and all your company. Put fire in them, put incense in them before the Lord, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. <clears throat> in Numbers 16, 50, Moshe becomes very angry. He said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey for them, nor have I hurt one of them. Ultimately, the polar opposite happens to Korak as he and his family are swallowed up by the earth. Then the demise of Korak's followers. Korach is like the people who practice religion instead of having a relationship. This is very prolific today. Very prolific. The practice instead of having a relationship. He wants to be the closest to God. This is what gets me. He actually viewed the closeness Moshe had with God as something he could come in and take. I actually thought he could come in and take that position. I'm like, boy, this guy's got a lot to learn. But he didn't get to learn. He is a model image of practicing religion instead of being in a relationship. Thus, in his mind, being elevated above the rest of the people, likened to the religious one who comes to us with that statement, and I've heard many times, the Lord gave me a word for you. You ever heard this? Did somebody come up? That's a self-elevating narcissistic statement. The Lord gave me a word for you. And I hear that, I go, really? I have ears too. You know, that's like, they do that just to elevate themselves, you know, puff up. In the ending, it's about them, not their word. This type of motivation is for God to do something for them. <clears throat> they want religion for their own gain. A relationship with God is God-centered. God is supposed to be at the very core of our lives with our every action revolving around his will. And the only place we can really know his will is when we go to the Torah. It's an example, it says in Corinthians, for us, not something that was done away with. They want religion for their own gain. But Karak represents the man or woman who comes to a church or synagogue seeking just the opposite. They want God to cater to their needs. It is a man-made and a man-centered religion, religious system. Theirs is a religion that's supposed to cater to them. It is a man-made and a man-centered religion. Enlighten them. Make them feel good. True edification points one deeper into God's word. True edification points one deeper into God's word. Even heaven becomes a place of me, myself, and I. To those that view religion as man-centered, heaven becomes a place with family, friends, golf games, fishing. No matter how they find, no matter how they live their life here on earth, with all gathered around each other. I will be with my spouse, my child, my uncle, my pet again. But Yeshua makes it clear when dialoguing with the Sadducees that there will be no marriage in heaven. 
Yeshua answered and said to them, <clears throat> in Luke 20, 34 through 38, the sons of this age marry and are in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moshe showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all to live to him. Strong words when you really look at them. Also in Luke, we have a proof that what Moshe said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, they are still alive. And if we question this, all we have to do is look at the passage, Luke 16, about the rich man and Lazarus. This is not a parable. It is about Abraham talking. Abraham is speaking in the New Testament. It's not a parable. So this proves that he is alive somewhere. He's alive right now, somewhere. The scribes that were listening to this conversation replied in com confirmation. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after that, they dared not question him anymore. And that's Luke 20, 39 through 40. The spiritual narcissist has the arrogance to agree or disagree with the very will of God. Changing it to suit them. This has been going on for 2,000 years. This is the selfish mindset that simply extends human narcissism into spiritual narcissism. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Yeshua, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, Teach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they not, will not endure sound doctrine. <clears throat> but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. They'll turn their ears away from God's teaching and instruction, his way of life he has for man, and be turned aside into fables. But you are to be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. <clears throat> we got to take that word evangelist and go back to the first century. Great big fat difference between evangelists in the first century and today. First of all, Evangelists in the first century took every opportunity they could to point people into the Torah, Yeshua and the had I said, as I said before, when I first got saved, had they told me, go to Genesis and start there, I would have been 100 miles ahead of where I am today. I would have been so much further ahead. By coming into the fullness of the Torah, then we get, we get the rest of the story. We see how it all fits. Understanding the ancient forms of study, the part is, it all fits. Korach re represents the spirit of division and strife. God is, of course, God is, of course, the spirit of peace and order. The spirit of strife and the spirit of peace are two definite spirits. However, we see in number 1622 that God is the owner of all. They fell on their faces and said, Oh God, the God of spirits and of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? The Hebrew is El Elohe Harukoth Lekol Basar. Ha, the Rukot spirits. The call of all, basar, flesh and meat. This same Hebrew sequence is repeated. The strife, the spirit of strife plays on discontentment. 
people with a grudge or more, on, more intent on overthrowing the current leader than on constructive plan of action of their own. Hate defeats rationality. All these, all these followers of Karak defined themselves by what they were against, not what they were for. And this is one of the keys to success in life is to focus on and talk about what you're for, not what you're against. Now, I've been guilty many times of talking about what I'm against. I've done it today even. So we have to learn to look at the good if we want to have a good outlook. <clears throat> Injured pride, the feeling that honor should have gone to myself, not him, has led to destructive and self-destructive action for as long as humans have existed on earth. We see a picture of this type of jealousy when Penanai would provoke Hanan for Samuel, when Saul was against David, the brothers were against Yosef, and the Sanhedrin were against them. This shot and after Aaron's rod, Bud again separates the two spirits. And the Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron's rod back with, before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put their complaints away from me, thus they die. Here, God separates the two spirits again. We might assume that Korach being a Levite, that there was disconnection between God and his Levites. God had set them apart to serve him in the temple. That is why Moshe questioned Korach. Isn't it enough that you're serving as a Levite? Some people just want to have it all, don't they? What does, what does Scripture tell us about the spiritual it was about the spirit of strife. In Romans 16, 17 through 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. What was the doctrine that they learned? Go right to John. Yeshua said it. My doctrine is not mine, but it is of him who sent me. So we always got to remember that when it's talking about doctrine in Scripture, not what some theologian came up with. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Yeshua, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. <clears throat> One man got so many people killed so fast. The Haftarah for this, the, the Brit Harishah Haftarah, the, the renewed covenant, it's a letter from Jude, from Judah. And he speaks of this attitude. But it's, it's very interesting when we go to Jude because this was from Jude to, Judah to first century believers. So in here we, we get a picture of what the way they looked at Korach in the first century. So let's go ahead and read Jude. Thank you, Paul. Jude, a bondservant of Yeshua HaMashiach, and brother of James, those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Yeshua HaMashiach, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. <clears throat> but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who do not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moshe, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, 
and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the rock, roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking around according to their own lusts, they, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Ruach HaKodesh. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Verse 3. He said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to God's people. Obedience. Paul writes a letter to the believers in Rome. Now remember, there were no churches. It was all synagogues. Not for 300 plus years, there was no such thing as a church. Romans 1 5. Through him we've received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. Amen. Obedience to the faith is a very interesting term. The obedience that comes from trusting Adonai and trusting his word. Acts 6 7 has a very important display for us. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now we got to stop for and think for a minute. There's many of the Kohanim became obedient to the faith. Does that mean that they joined a new religion? No. Like the joke at the Holy Sepulchre. The Tor told me he walked in the Holy Sepulcher and he just loves that building because it's. And he said, The joke here is this is where the Christians believe Jesus became the first Christian. <laughs> they, they joke about it in Israel. <laughs> first century. You have Kohanim that are Torah masters. They know the word, they knew that they knew the scriptures inside and out more than anybody today. Many of the Kohanim were obedient to the faith. Yeshua shows up, and I got this picture. He delivered the life of the Torah to the priests. He brought them the, the joy, the beautifulness. He erased the have to and turned it into a get to. Amen. And they saw it. And they jumped on it. Because now we have life more abundantly. Because they were loyal. They would kill. They would die for their Torah. They were not about to leave it. 
It wasn't even cross their mind. The first century believers mainly were Jews. And then there was Assyrians. And then there was people from the nations coming out that were dispersed. Northern kingdom people. They were all, their DNA was being woke up and they were coming back to the Torah of Elohim without man's religion, without the Talmud, without the fences. And it hit me. Why did they have to come up with all the fences? Because there was a lack of the spirit. The spirit is the convictor. And those who don't have the spirit need a lot of fences around themselves so they don't violate their Torah. So they have no spirit. It only made sense. They were lacking. So they had to overkill, overkill, and overkill. Wind up with a Shabbat elevator. Yeah. It's like Cecil said when he was in Israel on the Shabbat elevator. He said, why are there two elevators? He says, so we don't have to touch a button at every floor. I said, well, how do you get off the elevator? You have to do some sort of work. But this statement that comes off of Jude, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all God's people. And then we go to the obedience to the faith. And the Kohanim became obedient to the faith. Many did. This first century viewpoint not only includes and implies not only doctrine, John 7, 16, to be believed, but the entire place to go with our love and devotion to him and his will. I'm going to say it again. This first century viewpoint not only includes and implies not only doctrine to be believed, but the entire messianic way of life to be observed and obeyed as a place to go with our love and devotion to his will. But we look at to this first century view of Jew. Cox characteristics. Ungodly men is used several times in here. Let's go to that definition of that time and place. What was an ungodly person? One who said, we don't have to do that no more. Get that out of here. That's the law. That's done away with. We can be free in whatever we want. No, you're actually going into bondage without that. That's what brings us freedom. True spiritual freedom comes from Adonai. Abraham knew. He knew what was clean and unclean. Noah knew what was clean and unclean. The only place you're going to find out, you won't find it in a theology school, you find it in the Torah. What's clean and unclean, what is pleasing to the Father and what is not. Very crucial. If you want prayers answered, that's one of the main reasons for not unanswered prayers. Is the inability to adhere to the ways of God. Thinking that that was all such long ago that now it doesn't have any effect. Oh, man, big mistake to think that. Because he's not done. And we know the rest of the story. He's going to pull his people out of all their, and he is right now, we're all witnesses, pulled out of religious systems and plopped into his word. No other place I'd rather be. That's why I've had people say to me several times, how do you do it? You raise, you raise cows, you, raise, you have a ranch, you, and you come here and you work and you do these tourists. That, that is my freedom, man. That's where I come off the floor. God's word makes me float. I just love it, man. It, I, I, because he, he blessed me to have it all. And that is my edification. It's just, it's, it's so neat. As I've said before, our, our core cycle, every year we go up, make Aliyah spiritually, preparing for the world to come. So these are precious times. Every Yom Shabbat, none of us in here know how many more we're going to get. We could walk out that door and get flattened by a truck. We have no control over it. So we need to look, I'm talking to me now, as every Shabbat, the most important one. Every Shabbat needs to be the most important one. No matter what I got that's getting me down, tractor parts and things like that, all that nonsense of men, I have to realize God chose us to be in his sanctification. He chose us. He gave us a sign. 
between us and him. And we're, we're here today. Thank you, Abba. Your time that was sanctified in Genesis at creation. Thank you. Ungodly man. Ungodly man. I don't know how many times he says it in here, but he says it a lot. First and second century viewpoint, that meant people living without the ways of God. It's pretty plain. But he says, he mentions three men. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. He's, he's comparing people that are sneaking around, coming into the synagogues, as those three guys. And I, I, I drew a little chart. I, I drew, I, you can't see it, but I put the two, three names down. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Right above it, I wrote self. And then I drew three little arrows going down to each three little men. And then I looked at Cain. It was jealousy and self. Jealousy and self. God didn't like his vegetables. Balaam, greed. He wanted money for himself. Korak was all of them combined. God talked to Cain. God talked to Balaam. Had a pretty good dialogue. Never said a word to Korak. Korak was basically dead before he was born. But God is in control of everything for an example for us to watch and see. I truly believe this parashat was designed to protect community. But these, these men, these three men had no restraint in violating Adonai. They had no second thought about going against God. The same with the Tower of Babel. Everybody was going to do their own thing. They're going to do their own thing. God spoke to Cain and, ba and, and Balaam, but he did not speak to Korach. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. That's my Haftarah. Brother Shah. You bear of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. By their fruit, you will know them. Beware of false prophets. I'm going to say it again. There's two types of prophets. There's prophets like Balaam, and then there's prophets of God. Prophets of God means they keep Shabbat, they keep the Modim, they keep Kashrut, Nida, all the dietary laws, Togo, everything. They keep, to the best of their ability, the ways of God. All the prophets in Scripture were Torah observant prophets. So I want to I want to encourage everybody, no matter what the past 2,000 years has done to the word and to people, you're on the winner's side. And we need to live for him, to him. And that's that's what that's the best edification I can give people today. Is you've bypassed 2,000 years of corruption in the word and have gone back to the first century church, the first century synagogue. And man, that nothing feels better than that. Thank you for coming out today. Brother Darrell, thank you for your work. Shabbat Shalom. Trying out a new voice today. So thank you. I always count on Kinfo to give you the good word, right? Um, the Haftorah for this is for Korat has to do with the Saul becoming king. But I want to start out with is there an element of worship in submitting to authority? Is there an element of praise in submitting to authority? But most of all, is there an element of sacrifice in submitting to authority? And we're going to try to connect those dots and show you. It makes it very difficult in our society in the, in the, the uh, decades, if not uh, centuries, 
that we have been, our minds have been groomed to our individualism. That life is about me. And so people who give advice, you know, they, uh, in this, our time, they're, you know, they refer to as free thinkers. And uh, they like to say things like, I'm sure God wouldn't mind if you fill in the blank. And we're going to see how that's dangerous. Is everything that is appointed of God, is everything that is anointed his idea? And you may find a strange twist in the scriptures when it comes to this in the anointing of Saul, king over Israel, the first king. So let me... So the Haftarah comes from, oops, um, comes from 1 Samuel 11, 14 to 12, 22. But I want you to focus on the language. You know, anytime somebody wants to quote you a verse, just try to remember this formula. If they quote you a verse, you take a chapter. If they quote you a chapter, you take the book. If they quote you the book, then you have problems. If, they're, if you're in disagreement over the full context of the Word of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. So beginning at Saul, in 1 Samuel 11, 14, 15, it says, Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all of the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. They did. <clears throat> there they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Let me ask you, what authority did they have to offer sacrifices there? It would be a whole other lesson, but I just challenge you to search that out. What authority did they have to say that they, <clears throat> oh my gosh, you're a good man. Thank you. <laughs> what authority did they have to say, this man will be our king? And of course, Samuel's going to give you some insight of that. And in 1 Samuel 12, beginning of verse 1, it says, Now Samuel said to all Israel, Indeed, I have heeded your voice and all that you said to me and have made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. And in 12, 6 says, And Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron, not they. In between these chapters, it, uh, these verses here, and I didn't include it in there, and I, I should have now as I sat here thinking before I came up here. Rabbi brought up narcissism and narcissistic behavior. And I want to tell you, honestly, we live in a society that supports narcissism. And many, most parents in, in, in the West, in the Western countries, are raising narcissists. It's about me. They are so worried about, the wor about themselves being relevant in the world and not worried about being relevant to God, to Yeshua. We have to be... But one of the things that in the verses to verse 6 is Samuel disarms the narcissistic. He, he disarms the narcissist. He knows it's coming. And of course, Samuel was very familiar with the Torah portion Rabbi just taught. And he basically goes and says, uh, well, I'll read it to you. Let's just do that. It says in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I cheated? 
Whom have I oppressed or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes? I will restore it to you. And they said, you have not cheated us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. Then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you. And his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they answered, he is with us. What did he just do? Anything that come who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. And verse 80 says, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt. And in verse 11, he says, and the Lord sent Yerubbaal, Bedan, Yefta, Shmuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And you would think they would get it by now. They didn't. And when they had saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, and when you saw the king of uh, Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. They didn't get it. And verse 13 says, Now therefore, here is the king from whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. So what you ask is what you will get. And when they said, We will have a king, he gave him a king, and now you're about to get what you asked for because it was not his chosen. So see, not everything that is appointed is of God. Not everything is anointed was his idea. How do we know that they knew better? Because we can back up to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and read, beginning at verse 4, it says, Then all of the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. We all want to hear that. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Ooh, that's narcissistic behavior. See, you find fault. You're old. Your sons don't even walk in your way. You know, your family isn't even involved in this with you. Sound familiar? We all have family members that are not willing to judge us like Christians. We want to be like them. Look, they have armies and kings. We need to have the same thing. Can you hear the whining in that? And in verse 7 it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. You've asked for Saul and you are forsaken your God. You're going to get Saul. Verse 10 says, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties and will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them to his work. You're going to get what you asked for. 
and he will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. That's what you're getting with Saul. And Saul did not disappoint. <clears throat> In verse 18 it says, And you will cry out in that day, because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. You've made your choice. It's difficult to understand the Hebraic origins of the scriptures that we read. At the very least, I can say that if you're reading these Torah portions and these half Torah portions and you're still here, after so long a time, we are in a struggle together to understand these things. Because we were not raised in that culture. We do not understand all the idioms, so we search it out and try to understand. And then the element of worship and the element of sacrifice that I mentioned earlier. In 1 Peter 2.5 it says, You also as living stones are being built up in a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Messiah Yeshua. What does this have to do with Saul? Narcissism is just the opposite of the ways of God. In Romans 12.1 12, 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. You have to understand when you see sacrifice and worship, they go hand in hand. The sacrifices were slain at the door of the sanctuary. You weren't getting into that intimacy until something of value was lost and the blood was poured out from that animal at that time. In a spiritual sense, we are not going to get intimacy until we present ourselves as the sacrifice in a spiritual sense. We are not going to have any sanctification in the sanctuary. We are not going to have any peace until we put away our narcissism, my narcissism. People say, well, my, my, my self-desires rose up. Man, your self-desires were already out of the, off the charts like mine. Because that's how we were raised. People sue each other in our society at whim because I have to win. It's another element of narcissism. I have to win. This school turned turn my kid down. How dare you? I'll sue you. How could you do that? Because my kid is not like all those others. Spiritual narcissism. Exodus 25, 8, and I just mentioned this. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. You see the intimacy. He's dwelling in that sanctuary, but you're not going to get past that door you give yourself up. You have to give something up. You have to put a part of yourself to death in order to get that level of intimacy with your father. Leviticus 17.8 says, Also you shall say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell among you who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle, of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. And here's the problem is later on in this, in, in 1 Samuel, as Saul was waiting for Samuel to show up and the Philistines were banging at his door, he sacrificed. And it was a mistake because he had no authority in the Torah to do so. And Samuel told him that. And Samuel told him, you're losing, you're going to lose your reign because of this. And he did. Authority in the kahal, in the assembly, here, us, you and me, we, 
we come here together. And honestly, we serve each other. You edify my life. I do my best to serve you in whatever way I do. I'm not really sure, but. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, we're going to learn that this doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means because we're going to put the Hebrew to the test on this verse, these verses. It says, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. That sounds Narcissistic, does it not? It's about you, you being the temple. Let's look at the Hebrew and see what the Hebrew text says. Where it says, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. If you'll see the highlighted Hebrew, it's the word kahal. It's not you, it's us. It's all of us. It's not just about me. It's us. So is there an element of worship and submitting to authority in the kahal? Yes. And I can assure you that standing up here, it's very weighty to be where, where I'm at. And I know Rabbi feels the same way. It's very weighty because we bear far more, we have far more to lose by standing up in the position that we stand by, by this very reason, by us being in this position. If we get it wrong, we have a great deal of responsibility to pay for that. Maligning the word of God is not ignored by God. And if we ever did that, it would be a dark day for us. So we're, if you look at it now, and if it says, for the temple of God, the kahal of God is holy. Which temple, the kahal, we are, is really what it, it in, hebraically should read. It's what we are. Remember, he raised a people. He raised nations. He raised leaders among those people, but they were of those people. Mark 3.14 uh, says, then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. I got news for you. Reading the Gospels in the flesh, I would have picked a different crowd than those 12. Because in the flesh, I was like, this is not the dirty dozen. You know, these guys are not taking the walls. But they were taking the walls, the spiritual walls. They were conquerors. And this is one I want to leave you with that is going to have a completely different meaning than you may have ever had for Romans 13. And, and I'll conclude with this. You know, being in law enforcement all the years I was in law enforcement, they used to love Romans 13 because it somehow validated the, the, the occupation, the career, and that we were, you know, we were standing up for right and doing God's work and 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 that's what they felt because we were we were appointed in the government to do these things and it's really not it's really not what it means it really isn't so I'll read it through let every soul be subject to the governing authorities now immediately what we think in our way of thinking is govern meant. And that is not what it means. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. I want you to think about <clears throat> what's going on in our nation alone, and the, what is going on in our government. And if you can convince me that it is appointed by God to, to accept some of the things that our government accepts, and to give tacit approval to some of the things that it approves of, then I, I have some serious challenges from the Torah for you on that. And going on, it says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. 
And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. If you do good in our society, you will not have praise of the same. You will not. You will be hated by your government for doing what is good in these days. For he is God's minister to you for good. This is the one that he always threw at us when I was a, a cop. So oh, I was a minister for good. It sounded one, so wonderful. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister. And I got news for you. Being in law enforcement for a long time, very, very few of them would have fit the God's minister description. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. This is about the kahal. That's what this is not talking about submitting to government. It's a submitting to the kahal, a submitting to each other. We look to each other for validation that we are living the Torah life. That doesn't, that doesn't bode well in our, for us because, you know, we're like, how, how, you know, that's my business. It's nobody else's business but mine, what, what I do. But in the kahal, we are each other's business. We really are. Who would we be if we allowed someone that is spiritually poisoned to sit in here and remain in here and poison everybody in here? What, do we not have duty for something like that? Surely we do. So I hope this has been somewhat of enlightening and may have changed your viewpoint, especially of Romans 13. It doesn't exactly mean what we think it means. So Shabbat Shalom and thank you very much.